so last time we started to talk about, or uh, we actually got, uh, we almost finished talking about safety and liveness. Uh, and I wanted to just wrap up the discussion of, of safety and liveness properties from last time. Uh, so, so let's recap what we said before about that. So, um, so a safety property, we had we we distinguished between between safety and liveness properties. A safety property is one that uh, colloquially it says uh, something bad never happens. And a characteristic of these properties is that they can't, or, or excuse me, that they can be violated in a finite execution. So examples of safety properties are all of the delivery guarantees that we've talked about so far. So FIFO and FIFO delivery, causal delivery, totally ordered delivery. These, these properties are all safety properties. Uh, and the reason for that is that you could, in a finite execution, violate all these properties. So you could draw a line here making this a finite execution, and then there's a, you can see that there's a violation of that property. Uh, on the aliveness property, on the other hand, is one that says something good eventually happens. And aliveness property cannot. be violated in a finite execution. And the reason for that is that uh, in a liveness property, it's going to be something where if it hasn't uh, been satisfied in a finite execution, you can say it's, uh, it's just, it just hasn't been satisfied yet. Uh, so we gave an example of that last time, uh, and the example of a liveness property we had was uh, something like the system eventually responds to a client request. So if you had a client and a system and the client makes a request, right, and then some time goes by, this is not to say that the, the system is never going to respond to the request, right? So the property... Uh, that the system eventually responds to every client request uh, has not been violated yet. Um, so liveness properties don't have finite counterexamples. I can't draw a picture of a finite execution that violates this property. Um, so I think one thing I started to talk about briefly last time was that um, the trouble is that you really need both liveness and safety properties. And I say the trouble because that makes reasoning harder, right? If we only had to reason about, about safety properties uh, or liveness properties, uh, then that would be easier. But we, we really need both. And so here's why. Let's say I asked you to implement a protocol that satisfies, say, FIFO delivery. And I told you, you didn't need to worry about liveness at all. Uh, well, what could you do, right? If I said you only needed the, the property of FIFO delivery, which is a safety property, uh, we talked about this a couple days ago. So you could build a system that just drops or ignores every message, right? Uh, and so on. Does it satisfy FIFO? It does, actually, because you're never doing the bad thing, right? So FIFO just says that a bad thing never happens. This satisfies FIFO. Uh, 
uh, messages never get delivered in the wrong order because they don't get delivered at all, right? So good job, you get an A. Um, so safety properties by themselves are useless. Um, uh, but it turns out that liveness by itself is also useless. Uh, and we'll talk about that more later on uh, when we talk about the CAP theorem. Uh, by the way, somebody's asking on Twitch if they can ask a question. Yes, please ask your question. Uh, I can't guarantee that I'll answer it, but you should ask it for sure. Um, all right, so um, have we talked about any properties yet that are, that are liveness properties, uh, other than this um, system eventually responds to every request thing that I, that I just made up? Have we talked about any liveness properties? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Yeah, absolutely. Reliable delivery is an example. So we, we talked about it. We haven't defined it formally yet, uh, but we've, we've talked about it. So let's actually give a definition to reliable delivery. Um, so how do we define this? varies depending on who you ask. Um, but, okay, so here's one definition. We'll say this. Let P1 be a process that sends a message M to process P2. If neither P1 nor P2 crashes, then P2 eventually delivers M. Sometimes you see people add another piece to this definition as well. Uh, they'll say, uh, if neither P1 nor P2 crashes and not all messages are lost. Um, so this is kind of interesting, right? Why would people define this in different ways? Uh, and that actually leads us into the topic of fault models, uh, which we're going to talk about uh, in a little while. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm claiming that, that reliable delivery is a liveness property. Why is it a liveness property? Um, well, it says that something good eventually happens, right? Eventually M gets delivered. Um, but furthermore, we can tell that it's not a safety property, uh, right? Because it can't be violated uh, in a finite execution. Uh, uh, we don't um, we don't have a finite counterexample for it, or we can't draw a picture of a finite execution that violates this reliable delivery property. So, since all properties that we care about are either safety properties or live, liveness properties or a combination of both, and we know it's not safety, um, then we know it has to be a liveness property. Um, so this is this is the first liveness property that we've uh, formally defined, I think. Questions about that? Okay, so we're gonna talk about fault models. Um, so this is a new topic. That I've kind of been hinting for a couple of days that we'll get to. So when you're designing a system, you need to start by making certain assumptions about the environment in which that system operates, right? 
So in particular, if you're building, uh, if you're trying to build a fault tolerant system, if you're trying to design a fault tolerant system, then you need to have some sort of an idea about what kind of faults may occur, right? So that you know what kind of faults you need to tolerate. It doesn't mean anything to say that your system is, is fault tolerant if you don't have a definition of what it is to be a fault. So we need some way of defining and classifying faults and putting them in categories. Um, and a fault model is something that tells you which categories of faults can occur so that you know which ones you need to worry about. So if you think back to uh, day one or day two of class, um, day two for people who are in the class at UCSC, I guess day one for people who were watching on Twitch, um, we had this situation with two machines, right, where, where machine one wants to ask machine two a question uh, and, and get a response. So machine one is asking what the value of x is and uh, machine two is hopefully answering. We talked about a bunch of different ways in which this could go wrong. Um, so let's quickly uh, remind ourselves what, what some of those ways were. So um, message from M1 to M2 could get lost. Um, message from M1 to M2 is slow. M2 crashes. Um, M2 is slow. Um, and then in the other direction, uh, some of the same things could happen, right? Um, the message from M2 to M1 could be slow, or the message from M2 to M1 could get lost, right? Um, so that's like five and six, right? And then one that, uh, that we very briefly also discussed um, is uh, M2 lies, right? Or messages get corrupted. Um, so let's try to classify all these faults into categories. Um, so for this first one, um, uh, when a message from M1 to M2 gets lost, um, or when a message from M2 to M1 gets lost, uh, let's call that an omission fault. So a message getting lost is called an omission fault. What about a message being slow? What would you call that? So there's different choices for this. Um, sometimes people call that a performance fault. Um, I'm gonna call that a timing fault. Um, same one for um, uh, the message from M2 to M1 being slow. Um, how about number three, uh, where M2 crashes? Um, well, this one is what we call a crash fault. Um, number four, this is another timing fault. This would be where the, the machine is being slow rather than the, the network being slow. Or another way to say that is that it's um, the process being slow rather than the channel being slow. Um, but we'll, we'll put it in that same category of timing faults. Um, so number five here, slowness here is another timing fault. Uh, message being lost here, this is another omission fault. Um, so let's put those down um, and, and give uh, some informal definitions for those. So types of faults. So omission fault a message is lost 
timing fault. Uh, a message for process is slow. This is an informal definition. I'm, I'm intentionally not defining like what it means for something to be slow. Uh, and we'll come back to that. Uh, and then we said a crash fault, a process crashes. So that I think covers everything on this picture um, except for one. Um, so which uh, which did I not uh, which did I not cover here in that categorization of faults? Number seven, <laughs> being evil, right? Hmm. So um, so we briefly talked about that on the first day of class, actually. So what what kind of fault is that? <laughs> Byzantine fault. Good. Um, I'm going to say malicious or arbitrary behavior. All right, so that's at least four different kinds of faults that we have. Omission faults, uh, timing faults, crash faults, Byzantine faults. Um, this is a kind of classic way of categorizing faults. Um, why is it called Byzantine? Somebody asked in chat. Um, uh, historical reasons. Um, uh, so there's a, I, I, there's a, there's a, a, a famous paper uh, called the Byzantine General's Problem. Uh, from which this, uh, which popularized this term Byzantine faults. Um, but now you, the next obvious question is why was the paper called the Byzantine General's Problem? Um, and I, I don't think the answer is particularly interesting. Um, I, I think um, the author Leslie Lamport was just looking for uh, a catchy name that. Um, so the, uh, we'll talk more about this later. But um, uh, the idea is that there are these uh, these these two generals with their armies that are attempting to communicate. And he didn't, uh, he didn't want to use the name of any, uh, uh, I guess, extant country, um, because uh, uh, he didn't want that to, um, uh, he, didn't, he didn't want to do that. So, um, so he picked this name Byzantine, and, uh, and I guess it stuck. Um, so this is a classic way of categorizing faults. Um, and this is a taxonomy of faults that distributed systems people have been using um, since at least the 90s. Um, so let's try and, uh, and define these types of faults uh, just a little bit more precisely and try to create a hierarchy of them as well. So at the bottom of the hierarchy, um, we'll say our crash faults. Uh, so, by the way, somebody just uh, posted a link to the, the two generals problem. Um, we're actually going to be talking about the two generals problem in a little while. Um, so, the, the, the Byzantine generals problem uh, is uh, um, distinct, related to, but distinct from the two generals problem. Um, okay, so let's let's talk about uh, the um, like at the kind of bottom of the fault hierarchy um, are crash faults. So let's talk about those first. So in a crash fault, um, we say a process fails by halting. And that means it stops sending or receiving any messages. Now processes can have 
uh, internal events as well as sends and receives, right? So you might ask, well, uh, if it stopped sending and receiving messages, is it still allowed to have internal events even though it crashed? And well, I suppose the answer is yes, but it doesn't really matter, right? Because if it can't send or receive any messages, then it can't communicate with other processes anyway. So it, uh, it can't have an effect on the, the behavior of the system outside itself anyway. So it might as well not be having any internal events because uh, its behavior doesn't matter to the behavior of the rest of the system. So that's a crash fault. Um, in an omission fault, that's kind of the next step up in the hierarchy. And we'll talk about why these are in this hierarchy in a minute. Um, this is when a message is lost. And you could think of this as a process uh, failing to send or receive a message. In a timing fault, we say a process responds too late. So the way that some people define timing fault is they say a, a timing fault is when a process responds too late or too early. Um, so, so this is kind of interesting, um, and that would be something that that would be a way that you might define timing faults, let's say, at the hardware level. Um, for us, um, it's more common to have the kind of timing fault where something is slow and we want it to be fast, where rather than than to have the kind where something is fast and we want it to be slow. Uh, for the most part, though, it's kind of a moot point because we're not going to be discussing timing faults very much at all in this course. And the reason why is because we're mostly going to be talking about the asynchronous network model uh, where there are no uh, guarantees on the length of time that a message can take. So if there is no guarantee on the length of time that messages can take, then by definition, we can't really have timing faults uh, because there were no guarantees in the first place that were supposed to be abided by. Um, so I'm including it here because it's sometimes included in the literature on these things. But for the most part, we're not going to be talking about timing faults. Um, and then finally, in a Byzantine fault, um, process behaves in an arbitrary or even malicious way. So these are slightly more rigorous definitions than I had on the, on the last piece of paper. So these are the types of faults we're interested in. Um, let's just go ahead and cross out timing fault because that's not really going to be a part of our fault model for the most part. So we're mostly just going to be thinking about these, these three kinds of faults. And even then, we're going to be spending most of our time talking about these two, crash faults and omission faults. So, why did they go in this order? Why am I putting them in this hierarchy? Um, so let's talk about that. So let's say that we have some protocol, uh, some set of rules by which processes send and receive messages, and call it protocol X. And let's say that protocol X tolerates crash faults. And let's say that we have some other protocol, call it protocol Y, that implements the same behavior, um, but protocol Y tolerates omission faults. Okay, so my question for you is, 
does protocol Y also tolerate crash faults? If we say it tolerates omission faults, does it also have to tolerate crash faults? What do you think? And why? Okay, uh, okay, so one answer is, yeah, so since omission faults are higher on the hierarchy, they should be able to handle crash faults, but okay, but why? Why are omission faults higher on the hierarchy? So somebody says, yeah, okay, because a process crashing is similar to the message not being received indefinitely. Yeah, so crash faults can be thought of as a special case of omission faults where all the messages to and from a particular process get lost, right? So if a process crashes, um, if a process is going along, having events, and then it crashes, uh, from that point onward, uh, every message send and every message received that would have happened, you can say, well, that, that's uh, an omission fault. So crash faults can be thought of as a special case of omission faults. So a protocol that tolerates omission faults uh, also has to tolerate crash faults. Um, so... Um, <laughs> the, the way that I wrote it on this page when I said crash faults are at the top of the hierarchy, I guess what I meant was uh, they were at the bottom of the hierarchy. They were at the top of the page because they were the most fundamental one that I, that I wanted to talk about first, or the, uh, the kind of the, the first one that you wanted to try, that you want to try to uh, be tolerant of. Um, so we can draw a picture um, illustrating how these categories of faults are nested. Um, so, Crash faults go here, and omission faults go here. Um, and again, why is this the case? Um, it's because crash faults. are the special case of omission faults where all messages uh, to and from a process get lost after some point so we say crash faults are a proper subset of omission faults okay so if we wanted to put timing faults on this picture uh, then we could um, we could say something like this So why is that? Why are timing faults uh, a superset of, of omission faults here? Um, it's because omission faults are the special case of timing faults where messages are infinitely slow. So a timing fault is when a message or a, or a process is too slow. 
omission faults are the special case of that where messages are infinitely slow. So a protocol that tolerates timing faults also tolerates omission faults. Um, and since we just said that crash faults are a subset of omission faults, it has to tolerate those too. So timing faults will encompass both of those. That having been said, um, we aren't really going to talk much about timing faults. Um, and the, then finally, let's say that we have a protocol that tolerates Byzantine faults. So remember, a Byzantine fault is when a process behaves in an arbitrary or, or a malicious way. Um, oh, so somebody just wanted to see this definition. Um, so this is actually, um, uh, this isn't the definition of, of crash faults, but it's, uh, it's a fact about crash faults. So we say crash faults are the special case of omission faults, where all messages to or from a process get lost after some point. Uh, the definition is what I put here. A crash fault is just when a process fails by halting. OK, so what about Byzantine faults? Uh, so if we have some other protocol that tolerates Byzantine faults, um, does it have to also tolerate all these other kinds of faults? If I claim that the process, or if I claim that the protocol is uh, is Byzantine fault tolerant, does it have to be tolerant of these other kinds of faults as well? So some folks are saying uh, saying no. Um, so I would argue that it does, actually. So the thing about a Byzantine fault is that the faulty process can do anything it wants, including mimicking the fault behaviors that you get with these other kinds of faults. Um, so a process that wanted to exhibit Byzantine behavior uh, could say, I'm going to pretend to crash now. And then from that point onward, it, uh, other processes would think it had crashed because it wouldn't be sending any messages or wouldn't be responding to any messages. Or um, a process exhibiting Byzantine behavior could say, I'm just not going to selectively not send some messages. And then that would look like an omission fault to the rest of the system. Um, so these are all considered uh, a subset of Byzantine faults. So timing faults are a subset of Byzantine faults. Omission faults are a subset of timing faults. Crash faults are a subset of omission faults. Um, questions about this? There's a paper um, that I want to refer you to. Uh, the paper is actually uh, not uh, specifically about fault models, but it has a nice uh, illustration of the taxonomy of fault models in it. So I'm going to point you at it anyway. Um, the paper is called Atomic Broadcast. From simple message diffusion to Byzantine agreement. And this paper is from uh, 1994. So I can't remember if this exact figure is in that paper, but something a lot like it is. Okay. So let's go back to our, to our example of protocol X and protocol Y. Where we said uh, protocol X uh, tolerates crash faults. And protocol Y tolerates omission faults. 
So which of these would you say is more fault tolerant, X or Y? Yeah, why is, right? Because it tolerates all the faults that x does plus more. Um, and which of x or y do you think is going to be more complicated and expensive to implement? Yeah, also why, right? Because in general, the larger the class of faults that a protocol tolerates, the more complicated and expensive it's going to be to implement. Byzantine fault tolerance is the most complicated and most expensive of all. Uh, so this is the classic picture that you'll see if you go and look at the literature on fault tolerance. Um, so the only thing that's, that we're going to do differently uh, is that for the most part, we're not going to talk too much about timing faults. Um, so the reason for that is all bugs have to be relative to a specification. And so if we had a specification that said that messages couldn't take more than a certain amount of time to be delivered, then we could have timing faults. But we don't have a specification like that when we're in the async network model. Uh, because remember, an asynchronous network is one where there's no n such that no message takes longer than n units of time to be delivered. So messages can be arbitrarily slow. So timing faults are sort of not applicable in our world of the asynchronous network model. Um, so for us, um, the picture is kind of just going to look more like this. So our hierarchy is going to be like crash faults, omission faults, Byzantine faults. Um, so it should be pointed out that this particular hierarchy of faults is not the only one that we could use. And we could actually subdivide some of these classes of faults further. Um, so for instance, take Byzantine faults. Some Byzantine faults are going to be easier to deal with than others. What would be an example of a, of a Byzantine fault that might be relatively easy to deal with? And I'm going to uh, draw a cleaner version of this same picture. And so while I'm doing that, uh, can you think of what a, a Byzantine fault might be that would be relatively easy to deal with? Great. Yeah, so some people have made a couple of suggestions. Uh, so messages getting duplicated or uh, when the receiver gets the wrong message. Yeah, so a message that gets altered is a Byzantine fault. Um, but some kinds of alterations are detectable uh, using techniques like checksums or error correcting codes. So if you receive a message and you can tell that it's been corrupted, then maybe that's not so bad, right? Um, what's worse is when the message is so cleverly corrupted that the authentication technique that you're using fails to detect the corruption, right? Uh, so, so really, we could distinguish between the kinds of corrupted messages that we can detect and those that we, that we can't necessarily detect. So we can say uh, authentication detectable. authentication detectable Byzantine faults. And then that falls inside this larger class of uh, Byzantine faults. 
So authentication detectable Byzantine faults are a subset of Byzantine faults. What can you do when you detect that a message has been corrupted? Any ideas? Yeah, you just discard it. You drop it on the floor or ignore it. So basically, if you have some kind of authentication technique, then you can downgrade certain kinds of Byzantine faults to omission faults. If the message is corrupted, then it's as though it never happened. So then it's, an, then it's just an omission fault instead of being a Byzantine fault. So the particular details of this, uh, these authentication techniques are outside of the scope of this class. Uh, but if you want to know more about that, maybe take a security class or talk to my colleague Owen Arden about that. Okay, so now that we have all of these different nested classes of faults defined, uh, we can maybe a little bit more formally say what a fault model is. So a fault model is a specification that specifies what kinds of faults a system may exhibit And this defines what kinds of faults are to be tolerated by the system. So each of these kinds of faults corresponds to a fault model. Uh, if you're assuming that you're working with the crash model, then your system has to be tolerant of crash faults. If you're assuming the omission fault model, then what kind of faults do you have to be tolerant of? You have to be tolerant of omission faults and also crash faults because those are included in omission faults. And if you're assuming the Byzantine fault model, you have to be tolerant of Byzantine faults, which implies that you have to be tolerant of all these other kinds of faults. Um, so fault models are nested just like these classes of faults are. And as you move outward in this circle, uh, the fault models uh, get uh, uh, more and more, uh, m less and less forgiving, let's say, um, because more and more bad things can happen as we move outwards. So which fault model are we going to be spending most of our time on in this class? Um, mostly we're going to be looking at the omission model. So in the omission model, not as many bad things can happen as in the fully general Byzantine model. It's true. But it's still a model where a lot of bad things can happen. And so it's still pretty hard to implement protocols and algorithms that assume the omission model because those protocols and algorithms still have to tolerate a lot of bad things. In fact, there are a lot of things that one would like to be able to do in distributed systems that are impossible to do in the omission model. Uh, and so that kind of leads us into the topic uh, that I want to talk about next, which is which we was, was hinted at a moment ago, um, uh, which is a classic thought experiment in distributed computing called the two generals problem. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to have time to talk about it entirely today, uh, and we're going to pause and do a quiz question, uh, but if I have time after the quiz question, we'll start to talk about the two generals problem. So here's our quiz question. 
and we'll wait a few minutes for that. Yeah, so if on your first attempt of the form is closed, uh, try now. We'll give it maybe one more minute. Okay. So in the time that we have left, and I don't know if we'll get through it all, but let's let's give it a shot. Um, let's start to talk about this this classic thought experiment of the two generals problem. Um, so this is old; it dates back to the seventies. And uh, in the original setup. Um, it actually wasn't about two generals, it was about two uh, groups of organized criminals. And uh, somehow it became, it morphed into the two generals problem in the, in the intervening years. Uh, anyway, the idea is the following. Um, so suppose we have two generals with their armies, General Alice and General Bob, and they're each encamped on a hill. Uh, with their armies. And in the valley in between, uh, the enemy is encamped. So Alice and Bob know that neither one of them on their own is strong enough to attack the enemy. But if they work together, then they outnumber the enemy. So they'd like to both attack the enemy at the same time. The only problem is that they're too far away to communicate uh, via smoke signals or anything like that. So the only way to send a message is to send a messenger through the valley uh, who will sometimes be captured by the enemy and sometimes not. And if a messenger is captured, then the message that they're carrying is lost. Um, so let's walk through what would happen in the best case scenario where no messages are lost and everything goes fine. Um, 
So let's say that Alice wants to attack tomorrow at dawn. So she sends a message over to Bob. Um, and, you know, we could draw it with a Lamport diagram if we wanted to. Uh, uh, but let's just talk about it uh, informally for now. So Alice sends a message to Bob saying, I want to attack tomorrow at dawn. And so let's say Bob gets the message. Um, and at this point, Bob knows that Alice has proposed to attack at dawn. So at this point, should Alice go ahead and attack? Right, no, because Alice doesn't know that Bob got the message, right? She has no way of knowing at this point uh, whether her message got lost or not. So what should happen? Well, Bob should let Alice know that he got the message. So Bob should respond and say, okay, got it. Let's attack tomorrow at dawn. Cool, okay. So suppose that exchange of message happens and that message gets through and it's received and delivered on Alice's side. Now Alice knows that Bob got her message. Now is it safe for Alice to go ahead and attack at dawn? What do you think? No. Yeah, why not? Because, well, Bob doesn't know that his acknowledgement got to Alice, right? And he knows that if Alice doesn't see an acknowledgement, she won't attack. So Bob can't attack because he can't be sure that Alice is going to attack too. Um, so here's what our exchange of messages looks like so far. So Alice sent a message. and we can draw it in a Lamport diagram style. So Alice said, attack at dawn. You in? And then let's say Bob got that message and sent back. I'm in, attack at dawn. Okay, but as we've just established, that's not enough, right? Because even if Alice gets this confirmation from Bob, Bob doesn't know that this message arrived over here. So Bob doesn't know that Alice will attack for sure, right? Because Bob knows that Alice won't attack unless he confirms, right? And Bob can't attack unless he knows that Alice is going to attack. Okay, so, well, Bob could let Alice know that, that he got the message. Um, or, excuse me, Alice could let Bob know. Okay, it's on. But does that solve the problem? No, because Alice doesn't know that that message got through, right? So Bob could act that message as well. But of course, he doesn't know if that act was received. So can anyone think of a way to fix this? So it turns out that in the omission model, it is impossible for Alice and Bob to ever attack and know that the other one will attack. 
because it would require sending an infinite number of acknowledgments of acknowledgments of acknowledgments and so on. So, we can say in the omission model, which is what this, uh, this fable is an illustration of because messages could get lost. In the omission model, it is impossible for a general to know that the other will attack. This is one of many fundamental impossibility results in distributed systems, and it applies in any setting where there are two parties that are communicating and failures of communication can occur. So are there any workarounds? So one workaround is that before they went and camped out on these different hills, Alice and Bob conferred in person, right? And they agreed on a plan of attack. So that is what philosophers and logicians call common knowledge. So we'll say workaround for the two generals problem. Uh, make a plan in advance. So this is an example of common knowledge, which is actually a technical term. So we say, so common knowledge, uh, formally defined, um, we say that there is common knowledge of some piece of information P when everyone knows P Everyone knows that everyone knows P. And so on. and so on infinitely. So if there were some predetermined attack time that was common knowledge between Alice and Bob, uh, then that could work. That would be an example of having common knowledge. Somebody asked in chat, but what if the plan changed? Yeah, so then they wouldn't have common knowledge anymore. So that wouldn't work. Are there any other workarounds that we could do here? Well, so although it's impossible to solve this problem, in practice, it is possible for the generals to increase their confidence that the other general will attack, right? So maybe one way to do this is, would be for Alice to send a whole bunch of messages uh, at regular intervals, all saying, attack at dawn, right? 
sooner or later, let's say one of them gets through and Bob sends an ACK. And at that point, Alice can stop sending messages. So if Alice receives the ACK, right, and then Alice's messages stop coming through, uh, then over time, Bob will gradually grow more certain that Alice receives the ACK, right? That Alice received the ACK because the longer he goes without getting a message from her that says attack at dawn, the more sure he can be that she stopped sending them on purpose. Now, it could be the case that she is still sending them and all of them are getting lost, right? So he still can't be certain. Uh, but the probability of that, uh, we're assuming that that probability would be low and would get lower as time goes on. So even though this is impossible in general, there are workarounds uh, that make it uh, kind of practical to exchange messages and, and know that, not, or not necessarily know, but be reasonably confident uh, that, the, that the other participant got the message. Questions about this? All right, it doesn't look like there's any questions. Uh, so brief announcement, um, if, you're, uh, if you're taking the class, um, let me switch back to uh, another window here, one second. So those of you who are taking the class for credit, um, this is our schedule for the next few days. Um, so uh, we didn't get through all this stuff today. Um, but um, uh, we have lectures uh, Wednesday and Friday. Um, Monday, next Monday is our pause for breath day, which we're probably going to need because I don't think we're actually going to get through all this stuff in these days. And then next Wednesday is our midterm. So I haven't talked very much about what the format of the midterm is uh, yet because uh, I've still been figuring it out myself. Uh, but I promise that I will have an update on that soon. And uh, um, so assignment two is due uh, this week on Friday. Um, and then you have a little bit of a, of a homework break um, for a week, uh, which should allow you some time to study for the midterm. Uh, so the midterm is obviously going to be completely online, um, and we'll talk soon more about the, the format of it as soon as I get that figured out. Uh, that's it. Uh, any questions about that briefly before we have to wrap up? How long will the midterm be? Uh, if you mean like in terms of number of questions, um, so it's going to be, I, I don't know the exact number of questions, but it's going to be designed so that it can be reasonably done uh, during class, um, even barring things like internet problems. So uh, it'll be, uh, if anything, it'll be shorter than one that I would normally do for an, for an in-class, in-person midterm. Um, as far as uh, the details about how exactly um, it'll be implemented. I don't know the answers yet. So um, I'm, I'm trying to work that out right now. So I will update you on those things as soon as I can. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.